Friday the 22nd at 7 o'clock. Uh, please plan to be here. It's going to be a wonderful time of celebrating the goodness of the Lord. Uh, it'll be a time of, of uh, just, just pageantry, music. Uh, the children will be running about. It's going to be great. Uh, and if you don't, if you have a, a friend or a neighbor or a family member who doesn't know the Lord, uh, please in particular invite them uh, Friday night. Next Sunday is Christmas Sunday, and it's on Christmas Eve, and all of you are invited. Uh, it's just going to be a great week. This is a very holy and sacred week for us in, uh, in the Christian faith. And so I, I encourage all of you to be here. Now, we're going to read from the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter. And I'm going to begin reading in the eighth verse, speaking about just after Christ was born. Beginning in verse 8, it says, There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. Everybody say, all people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, when the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Now King David in the 34th Psalm after having been rescued from his enemies and his pursuers, began to declare the wonders of God. And in verse number three, he said these words, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Join with me again for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for your word. Grant to us, Lord, please, ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church this day. And for this, we thank you in Jesus' precious name. And amen. During this Christmas season, I've been sharing with you three simple elements of our faith that are intertwined and interwoven with the Christmas holiday, but that they are also required of us frankly, to live fulfilled and fruitful lives as children of God. Because the fact of the matter is, until we learn some of these things and learn to apply them in a daily basis into our lives, we will often find Christianity to be, at best, a religious discipline and, a, and at worst, a, a religious facade. And this is supposed to be a life that is full of life a life that is full of joy, a life that is full of hope, a life that is full of delight. And so the Lord has called us and asked of us and requires of us a sense of an awareness about him. And one of the things that has happened to us is that we have forgotten that when the, re the revelation of the king comes, what begins to take place is celebration, not just on earth, but in heaven. When Jesus was born, the angels in Luke chapter 2, verse 14 said, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And again, David's exhortation, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. The first element of Christmas, the first uh, a uh, simple uh, part of our faith that we have to embrace and walk on that we've and, and walk in rather that we've talked about so far this holiday season is that we have to learn to magnify the Lord. Number one in your in your notes on the back of your bulletin. We have to learn to magnify the Lord. Now, by magnifying the Lord, it doesn't mean that you're making him bigger. You do not increase the size, scope, veracity, power, distinction, wealth, dominion, honor, or glory of God by anything you do. 
There's nothing you can do to make the Lord magnificent. He is magnificent. There's nothing you can do to make the Lord glorious. He is glorious. There's nothing you can do to make the Lord high and lifted up. He is high and lifted up. There's nothing you can do to make, add, or, dis, or, or display God with any greater wealth, dominion, power, or glory than he already possesses in and of himself. So when David says, magnify the Lord with me, he's not saying you make him bigger. He's saying you see him bigger. See him more correctly. A quote I've been sharing with you by A.W. Tozer says this. The basic trouble with the church today is their unworthy concept of God. If our religion is weak, it's because our concept of God is weak. Christianity at any given time is strong or weak depending upon her concept of God. I'm positively sure that after many years of observation and prayer... And the basis of all our trouble today in religious circles is that our concept of God is too small. Beloved, if you view God as small, then the giants are large. If you view God as small, then the mountains are large. If you view God as small, then the valley is too deep. The enemies are too strong. The battles are too much. But if you start and ask the Lord to help you to see him correctly... This is why the word of God is so important. This is why prayer is so important. This is why being around believers is so important. Because we share one with another what the Lord is doing in our lives. The word of God tells us of the magnificence of God. The experiences we've had and share one with another. Tell us of the goodness of God. I shared with you last Sunday and I'll briefly go through it real quickly. Something that Dr. Kraft from Fuller Seminary Professor of Missiology there several years ago, uh, that uh, uh, a, a, an illustration that he said between God's reality and our reality. And so as we're standing here, if you go to the next slide, brother, uh, who's up there today? I can't see you. Hi, okay. <laughs> there you go. God's reality is everything that happens. God sees, God knows, God does, God experiences. I look at those hills and, and they're kind of a pretty beautiful canvas. God knows how many bugs are up there. God knows all the different kinds. God knows if there's a bug that lost a leg. God knows how, many, how much uh, molecules are up there. God knows everything that's going on everywhere. That's his reality. But as it approaches me, it begins to go through filters. And the first filter is the filter of belief. And, and what I believe can happen limits what does happen. I begin to eliminate things and possibilities from, from, from God moving in my life. I have not because I ask not. And oftentimes I ask without faith. I don't really believe. I'm just in a religious discipline. I'm not having a conversation. And so my unbelief limits not God, but what's getting through to me. And then the second filter as, it, as God's reality approaches me is the filter of experience. Some things I believe, but I haven't experienced. And then even when I experience some things, I'll go through the process of analysis. And I have this third filter working in my life. And all of a sudden, I, I have this great God who is magnificent and glorious and wonderful. But as, as life and as his glory begins to approach me, there are things I will not receive because I do not believe. Other things I will not receive because I've not learned to walk in them by my experience. And finally, there are things I will not receive because even though I've, I believe and I've experienced them, sometimes my analysis w throws the experience away. Amen. And suddenly now I've got a box. A very small box. And suddenly this is, this is the perception of God that I have. This is the perspective of God that I have. And all of a sudden I've begun to, to, to eliminate Vast swaths of what God could do, would do, wants to do, will be able to do if I'll only let him. See, he will not violate your will. He'll not violate your sense of self. He'll not violate your sense of dignity. He'll not violate your personhood. 
He will do and move into the places you vacate for him. He will do and move into the areas of your life you allow him into. No wonder David said, magnify the Lord with me. See him bigger. See him greater. See him more glorious. See him more honorable. See him more powerful. See the Lord as he is. This is why in talking about Jesus, Paul told the Colossian believers, he's the image of the invisible God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. By him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. What? Yes, the baby in a manger is a beautiful part of the Christmas story. But it's only beautiful if you understand the magnificence of the one who became a baby in a manger. He didn't grow into God. He was God and became a baby. He didn't grow into a man. He was God and became a baby and lived a life among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only. That guy who created all things, that's the baby in the manger. And so he's before all things and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So he is eternal, self-existent, self-sufficient, immutable, sovereign, infinite, boundless, transcendent, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, pure and perfect, complete in totality, holy, holy, holy is the only proper way to begin to describe him. You do not make him God and he does not answer to you. He needs not your approval nor your permission to run the universe. The only thing he allows is your freedom to whether or not you will serve him. He doesn't change if you don't follow him. You change. Magnify. 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 Oh, magnify the Lord with me. That brings us to number two in your notes. Only when you begin to magnify the Lord, only when we begin to see him differently, can the second element of Christmas and the second element of a fulfilled life, a fulfilled Christian life, begin to take place, and that is to glorify the Lord. Number two in your notes is to glorify the Lord. What will you say? How will you live your life? You may see him, friends. Once you, you, my friends, have to see him in a way and in a manner and in a, 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 an appropriateness that begins to allow your heart to respond appropriately to him. Everybody say this with me. Magnify, magnify. and glorify. As we begin to magnify, then we learn how to glorify. You cannot properly worship God unless you begin to see him correctly. You cannot properly worship God until you begin to see him as he is, high and lifted up. You must see him accurately. The only logical response to magnifying the Lord is to glorify the Lord. Worship is the only appropriate response of creation 
to the revelation of its creator. Worship is the only appropriate response of creation to the revelation of its creator. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Look again at our text. In Luke chapter 2, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Please notice, my friends, the promise within the worship. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The will of God is peace on earth. The will of God is goodwill toward men. This is his will. This is his intended purpose. This is his promise. It only can happen, however, when he is magnified and when he is glorified. The Lord has called us to live a life of worship. The Lord has called us to see Christ high and lift it up. The Lord has called us to call upon his name. The Lord has called us to celebrate his goodness, but the Lord has called us to reflect upon his beauty and his majesty, his splendor, and his glory. I want you to look in your notes. We're having a little trouble with the PowerPoint, so follow along on your notes. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3, it's under number 2 in your notes on the back of your bulletin. In Hebrews 1, verse 3, It says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. This tree reminds us of several things. It reminds us of the beauty of God. It reminds us of the majesty of God. It reminds us of the glory of God. And at chapel this year, as we began the Christmas season, I actually did a whole chapel about the Christmas tree and and its importance. It's not by chance that you have a baby born in a manger. The manger was either a trough made of wood or stone. We don't know for sure. But if it was wood, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Christ dies on a cross made of wood. His natural father is a carpenter. His heavenly father is a creator. And the Bible says that it was through Christ that all things were created. And that the sun is the radiance of God's glory. Now I want you to think about that. He is the exact representation of the father's being. In other words, Jesus coming to the earth is God in the flesh. And he sustains all things by his mere word. Last Sunday I introduced to you my son Christopher and he spoke about astronomical things and the, and the glory of God in the, in the heavens and that Christ sustains all of these things. I've asked him to come back and share with you a little bit today, not just about the astronomical things, but about the microbiological things. Everything in your life is in existence because Jesus Christ sustained you. Listen to me again. Everything in your life is in existence. Your breath is in existence because Jesus Christ sustains you. Whether you accept him or not, he he is sustaining your life right now. Those who curse his name, he sustains their life. Those who hate him, He sustains their life. If for one moment Christ ceases to sustain your life, you do not exist. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. So I've asked Christopher. Christopher is a teacher at Valley Christian High School. And uh, the Lord has blessed him and and put within him a real interest in uh, Christian apologetics and the things of Christ and the cross as well as as, uh, creation and and intelligent design. So would you please welcome Christopher in the name of the Lord.
Testing, testing. There we are. Hello. Good morning, guys. How's everybody doing? Merry Christmas to everybody. As I was on the side, I, I felt like I was going to be tagged in. I felt like I should have just been up here like, tag me in, tag me in, let's go. <laughs> it would be like the CCWF, the Christian Cathedral Wrestling Federation, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, after I get tagged in, my dad's going to go on the, on the balcony and, and elbow drop the first three pews or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> in retrospect uh, to speaking last week, you know, I had a lot of people come up to me and say how well I did. And, you know, I actually... I watched it, and I didn't do that good. I, I would have docked me down a couple points. But, uh, but as I was looking back, I know exactly what my dad did. It, we do this in education. It's called the sandwich effect. What happens is you have a, uh, whenever you have parent-teacher conferences, you come in, and you say something really good, and then you bring the bad. And then you say something really good again. And that's exactly what he's doing with me right now. He, he, this is the sandwich effect uh, happening right this moment. <laughs> All right, guys, so what I want to do today is to continue to magnify and glorify the Lord. Um, God has given us and ordained us the ability to see things and to observe things unlike any other species. And I, I went into a, a small glimpse into what the universe has to offer. And today I want us to go into what, what we can see on a micro level and on a cellular level and, and how we have the ability to, to have certain sciences that, that focus only on these issues and only on these things. And we have the ability to have something called biology as a science. Biology in itself is the study of life. So we're able to study life and how life works and how it flourishes and how God has created all these things and how he has meticulously woven all of these things that, to happen. There's different systems and there's engineering behind all of life, all of life. There's, there's engineering and there are systems. Okay, there's, there's systems called a whole package phenomenon, which means that the very first thing creates the very last thing that has to have the very first thing to even exist. Well, that's a whole package phenomenon, all right? You might be asking yourself, what's in the box? What's in the box? Don't worry, it's not Gwyneth Paltrow. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to let you guys know that uh, what we have in this box is a perfect analogy and a perfect model for us to be able to see how life exists and the fine-tuning of how life is existing. So in this box, we actually have an ecosphere. An ecosphere is a self-sustaining ecosystem. So NASA's Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory actually are the ones that developed this. So this entire sphere is, is enclosed. There's no way for me to feed the shrimp inside here. But the shrimp are going to live. Right now, I'm rocking their entire world. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the shrimp will live in here for two and a half to about three and a half years. Uh, Jay, we could go to the next slide now. So what happens in here is this is the perfect example and the model of a, a whole package phenomenon. So what happens is this ecosystem, it, it has three main things that happen for life to exist. One, it has water, so it has filtered salt water inside here. Two, it has a branch. Three, it has, it has light. It has light coming to it. And then you have the shrimp. So the shrimp are the living organism. They're, they are the living organism. And what's happening is the shrimp are able to eat the algae. They're able to eat the algae, and then what happens is they defecate out the right type of minerals and materials for them to be able to create microorganisms for then the algae to take and survive and be able to grow and flourish for the shrimp to be able to eat the algae, to defecate out the right type of minerals to create the microorganisms for the algae then to be able to grow and flourish and survive for the shrimp to be able to go ahead and eat more of the algae for them to be able to survive and flourish. It's a whole package phenomenon. It's irreducibly complex. You take out one thing of this entire system and all life will cease to exist in this, in this system. That is a, a, a small example of the intricacies that we have as humans. As human beings, there's a lot of different parameters that have to happen for us to be able to have a complex life, uh, especially a, a global high-tech civilization to flourish. 
But this gives us a, a base understanding, and it's a great tool for an educator to get through to students on how fine-tuned our, our life is and how our world is existing. So last week, I finished on a fun fact. I finished on a fun fact that there's actually more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on our planet. Well, that's crazy. That's intense. There's more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on our planet. And I think of that every time I go to the beach. Not really in Northern California because there are more, more rocky beaches. But in Southern California, there's a lot of beaches that are full of sand. And I would always go out and I'd pick up a big old handful of sand and, and watch the sand as it, as it falls down in between my fingers. And I think about that. And I wonder, oh my gosh, God, how, how marvelous are you? How amazing are you that, that there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the planet and you know each of them? You know each of them by name? That is ridiculous. And what's even crazier than that is there's actually more cells in your body than there are stars in the universe. And that's what we're going to go into right now is the cells. And uh, so this is an entire year curriculum, so I wish we were able to dive into everything that's happening within microbiology, but we're going we're gonna to stay uh, to one major aspect of microbiology, and that is DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid is what it's called. So DNA it dwells in all living organisms that we have been able to study thus far. So within DNA... DNA codes and it, it, it creates proteins. It's also what gives us uh, all of the different characteristics. Coincidentally, actually, in all humans, 99% of all of our DNA is the same. In our genome, 99% of our DNA is the same. That means 1% is what is changing your uniqueness is what's making you unique. It's what's changing your eye color. It's what's changing your, your hair color. It's what's changing the pigmentation of your skin. It's what's giving you your uniqueness. It even, even contributes to personality traits and behavior traits. And all of the different characteristics that each individual has is all within 1% of the genome. It's crazy. Every single cell, so there's about 75 to 120 trillion cells in your body. Every single cell has DNA. It has a DNA. It has your fingerprint. It has God's fingerprint inside every single DNA, inside every single cell. So much so that it's so crazy how God has actually had it because you have, you have a cell and then within the nucleus of a cell is where DNA resides. And within that, it, God actually shrunk it down and woven it down into something called a chromosome. And a chromosome kind of looks like that. So in a chromosome, if you were to take it and you were un to unwind it, you could take each DNA strand in every single one of your cells and stretch it out to about six feet tall. So it's about as tall as me in every single one of your cells. If you were to take all of the DNA inside of each one of your cells and you were to put it end by end, it would be able to stretch from here to the sun 600 times. And that's in your body right now. And that's crazy because the sun is not close to us. It's 92,870,000 miles away. And yet in your body alone, you have something that could technically be stretched from the sun to uh, back to the earth 600 times. That's marvelous. That's glorious. And God has given us the ability to comprehend this. It's crazy. Inside DNA, DNA codes the genetic makeup. The information within DNA is stored and coded. It's made up of four base chemicals. These chemicals are uh, adenine, A, guanine, G, cytosine, C, and thymine, T. A always will connect to T. C will always connect to G. Our DNA consists of about three billion bases. So each time one of these connect is, a, is considered a base within the, nu the, the full nucleotide. The order or sequence of these bases determines the information available for building and maintaining any organism. Similar to the way that letters in the alphabet are created, that you put certain letters together to create words, you, you put more together to create sentences, and you, you take more words and you create paragraphs. 
That's exactly how our coding of our DNA is structured. God has coded it. Even, uh, even though it codes all the information that makes up an organism, um, these unique features give us all of the things that make us unique. They give us our hair color. They give us our fingerprints. They give us things that are only defined to ourselves. This is uh, amazing. This is absolutely wonderful. And it, it, it's mind-blowing. These are the things that, that just blow my mind. That there, and then you go even further within DNA, and you, you take the, at, the atomic level. You go farther down, you go into the atomic level, and then in one DNA strand, there's more atoms in a DNA strand than there are stars in our galaxy. And that's crazy, because if you think about the atomic level for one, one second, let's think about it. You take a 12-point font. In your notes, there's a period. Go ahead and look at a period in your notes right now. You see how small that period is at the end of one of those sentences? Okay? That period alone, it would take 50,000 atoms lined up side by side to get from one side of that period to the next. Okay? It's unbelievable. Unbelievable how small and intricate God gets and how amazing God gets in fine-tuning everything that you're doing and everything that you know. And the same God that has done this, the same God that has orchestrated all of the cells in your body, all of the hairs on your head, everything about you, he knows exactly what heartbeat you're on right now. He knows exactly how many breaths you have taken to this point in time. He knows everything about you. That same God loves you so much that he gave his only son to die on a cross for your sins. Because right. he sees your frailty. He sees where you're at. He sees your sadness. He sees where, where, you, where you are, and he wants you just to be with him. So uh, go ahead and um, play the video, Jay. I have a, a small little video that I want to show you guys because it gives you a good understanding and a grasp of how magnificent a cell is. To be able to think of a cell, you have, to, you have to think of a cell being a very, very big city. Think of New York City. Think of, uh, think of Dubai. In these cells, in this cell, there are roadways. There are freeways. There are ways for it to travel. There are ways for the video to buffer. <laughs> there, there are roadways. There are, uh, there are freeways, there are sewage ways, there are machines in your cell. There are, there are machines that are doing certain things. There's a lipid raft that is transporting proteins from one side of the cell to the other. There is a motor protein that is literally walking down your, uh, your, your, your cells and, and making, making sure that proteins are moving from one side to the other. This is happening right now. One million cells die off every second, but one million are, are recreated every single second. This is creating the inner linings of the cell, the structure. It's a piece selection protein that, that's able to take cytoplasm and break it apart. It's a motor, a motor protein. It's moving a, a, basically that would be like your U-Haul truck full of proteins that it's moving. It's actually walking down from one side of the cell to the other. That is uh, RNA going through a nuclear pore co uh, uh, complex, which is the, taking, the, taking RNA from the inner part of the nucleus to the outer part of the cell for a ribosome to be able to come and transcribe it for it to be able to build the perfect protein for you to be able to function on your day-to-day -day lives. These functions are happening in every single one of your cells right now.
Okay? DNA is full of information. Information can only come from an intelligence. Even if the, uh, the receiver fails to receive that information, it does not stop the information from being information. So no matter what, we see this information in, in DNA. There's enough information in one strand of DNA that it would be the equivalent of you taking such dense material of a book, like an, uh, an encyclopedia, and it being a thousand pages long with a thousand, page, uh, thousand different books. That's how much information is in one strand of DNA. And if information can only come from an intelligence, then it's very hard for me to conclude that there's not a God that God is not the one that is behind that information. Um, let's go ahead and finish up and go to the last slide. Thank you, Jay. Um, what God has shown us is he's shown us a, a protein called laminin. Laminin is a three-part uh, adhesion molecule. What this does is it's an, an adhesion molecule that is the lining of all of our organs. It's the lining of all of our vital organs. It's the lining of our tissue. This, this protein right here holds us together. It's what's holding us together right now. I don't know about you, but that looks pretty familiar to me. Does that look familiar to you guys? Yeah. It looks like a cross. Any way you slice it, I tell my students this. Even if you don't believe in God, even if you don't believe in the cross, you're still held together by the cross. And right now, the cross is holding each and every one of you together. Amen. And he is going to be with you, rather you like it or not. And what he wants is you just to see him. He wants you to come to him. He's, whole, he's, he's there waiting for you with open arms, wanting you just to love him. He loves you with an everlasting love, a love that we can't even begin to fathom. And that love is there for you. All you have to do is want it back. You're not alone. Amen. You're not alone. God sees you, he loves you, and he just wants to be with you. Thank you guys for your time. You. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to Hebrews 1.3. Let's read it again. It's in your notes on the screen. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The universe is sustained by Christ. The universe exists because of Christ. The universe lasts today and tomorrow and however long it's going to last because of Christ. You are sustained by Christ. You exist because of Christ. You will exist today and tomorrow and however long you're going to exist because of Christ. And you know what? A hundred years from now, you'll be somewhere. Your physical body will give way because of the fall, but your spirit, your soul, your life continues on. And it's all because of Christ. And the fact of the matter is, the promise of Christmas is just holiday sentimentality. If there's no power, I'm going to say that again. This is a quaint, beautiful, kind story. If there's no power. And that's all it is. If God can't create and if he can't sustain, then he cannot redeem. But if he can create, and if he can sustain, and if he can call the vast stars of the universe and know each one by name, and look at every cell in your body and create in such a, a, a design and a way that you're, you have a living system, uh, 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 multiplied trillions of living systems within your system, 
your whole system, one of which is removed, wipes it out, but God sustains it all with his word, sustains it all with his grace. If he looks at you and sees within your life that failure that sin produces and that hatred that sin produces and that wickedness that sin produces and that and all those fallings that sin produces and yet looks at you and goes, I know exactly the remedy. I know exactly where to go in your heart. I know exactly where to go in your life. I know exactly how to get the waste out of your life and bring life back into your life. I can do what you cannot do for yourself. You cannot die for yourself. You cannot die for your son or your daughter or your wife or your husband and bring them into heaven's glory. You can't do it, but I can do it. So I'll send my son. This is what Christmas is. Christmas is not a quaint, tranquil, beautiful little story. Christmas is God in heaven, the creator and the sustainer of all things, not bound by time, not bound by space, not bound by dimension, but setting foot in time, in space, and in a, a, a dimension that you and I can't even begin to speak of, begin to understand. This is why. Isaiah would say his leadership will bring such prosperity as you've never seen before. Sustainable peace for all time. This child, God's promise to David, a throne forever among us to restore sound leadership that cannot be perverted or shaken. He will ensure justice without fail and absolute equity always. How? The intense passion of the eternal commander of heavenly armies will carry this to completion. Please read that last sentence again with me. The intense passion, everybody aloud, the intense passion of the eternal commander of heavenly armies will carry this to completion. This is not the work of a preacher. This is not the work of a king. This is not the work of a president. This is not the work of a prophet. This is not the work of a pastor. This is not the work of a noble, good person. This is not the work of a billionaire. This is not the work of a businessman. This is the work of God himself. No one else can, therefore no one else did. This is the, not even the work of an angel. This is not even the work of an army of angels. God so greatly loved, John 3, 16. God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him shall not perish, shall not come to destruction, shall not be lost, but will have everlasting life. My friend. If you're not walking in peace today, if you got the Christmas blues, if you're not walking in freedom today, if you're not walking in joy today, if you're not walking in the fullness of life today, if you're not walking in the sense of fruitfulness today, my friend, lift up your eye a little bit higher. See the Lord a little bit more accurately. Allow the song of the Lord to rise within your heart. Offer the sacrifice of praise. See his favor. See his shalom. See his peace. Magnify. Glorify. Psalm 139, 13, 14, that, that, a scripture that Christopher was going to allude to. I want to share it with you. You shaped me inside and out. You knitted me together in my mother's womb long before I took my first breath. I will offer you my grateful heart for I'm your unique creation filled with wonder and awe. You have approached even the smallest details with excellence. Your works are wonderful. I carry this knowledge deep within my soul. The Lord God, in verse 4 of our text, Psalm 34, verse 4, says that he delivered me from all my fears. Worship is the embracing of the perfect love of God. It drives out all fear, which is the enemy of peace. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Now let's go back to Luke chapter 2 as we wrap this up this morning. Look again at the angelic announcement, chapter 2, verse 10. The angel said unto them, fear not. Fear not. 
Should they have been afraid? Would you have been afraid? I have all sorts of people in my lifetime who have said to me, oh, I wish I could see an angel. I don't think you do. I really don't think you do. We, we got a bunch of little round-faced cherub paintings, and we think that's angels. That's not angels. That's not the angels described in the Bible. The angels described in the Bible go down and destroy cities. The angels described in the Bible can do all sorts of things and all sorts of damage. Jesus himself said, don't you realize that I could call ten legions of angels and destroy the world and be set free? So when the angels showed up, look at, well, look at our text. Let's look at it again. This time, uh, in beginning verse 10 and 11, the angel told them, stop being afraid. Listen, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. Today, your Savior, the Lord Messiah, was born in the city of, a of David. Verse 13, suddenly a multitude of the heavenly army appeared. A multitude of what? This wasn't our lovely choir dressed in red and green. This was the heavenly army. This wasn't our orchestra dressed in Christmas colors. This isn't the pastor standing before you, kind of, you know, middle-aged. Well, not even middle-aged. I'm not living to 110. Past middle-aged, all right? These are warriors. Amen. And the warrior army is standing. And the warrior army has weaponry. The warrior army is there to do the bidding of God. Should you be afraid? Yeah, you really should be afraid. But what do they say? Fear not. Why? Because God chose mercy over judgment. He chose grace over war. He chose peace over, over slaying the wicked. God is your redeemer. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Whenever the gospel is to be preached, it is to be preached as a gospel of peace. Do not be afraid. The song of the angel armies is not one of fear. It's not one of condemnation. It's not one of conquest. It's a message of assurance. Fear not. It's one of the great themes of scripture. Peace, wholeness, do not be afraid. Even in the middle of your night, even in the middle of your battles, even in the uncertainty of your future, do not be afraid. Zephaniah 3, 16. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. He'll take great delight in you. He'll quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Amen. Do not fear being disappointed. God is not a man. He does not lie. Do not fear that you're not worthy. God made you worthy in the blood of his son. Do not fear that you cannot obtain righteousness. You can't. He gives it to you. And he gives you the righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not by human effort. Do not be afraid that you're inadequate. He's adequate. Do not be afraid that you're incapable. He's capable. Do not be afraid that you have to make and hold it all together. No, he sustains and holds it all together. We fear so many things. This is the most prescribed, medicated, semi-comatose generation in the history of the world. We have more drugs given by doctors to calm people's fears than could have been imagined a hundred years ago. The gospel comes along and says, you don't need that. Don't be afraid. 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 Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. So Isaiah 43. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've summoned you by name. You're mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Notice he didn't say you'll skip the water, you'll skip the river, and you'll skip the fire. 
That's not the promise. The promise isn't that you won't have trouble. The promise is that if you magnify him, you can glorify him through the trouble. And it will not come near you. It will not overwhelm you. It will not overcome you. It will not destroy you. I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This is to be a season of worship, a season of peace, a season of hope, a season of joy. Do not be afraid. Well, Pastor, you don't know the financial problems I have. I agree, I don't. You don't know the ones I got. Do not be afraid. Pastor, you don't know what the doctor just said. I, no, I don't. But I've been on the wrong side of that message before. Yes. Pastor, you don't know the battle I'm having in my, in my home or in my, in my friendships or in my, in my business or in my ministry right now. I, you're right, I don't. But I know that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I know that the Lord has not only called you to this, but requires it of you. That you magnify him. That you see him differently. That you look at him more correctly. Not because he is insecure and needs your adoration and adulation. You need it. You need it. Worship and fear cannot coexist. And if you're not worshiping, then you're not seeing the Lord correctly. If you're not worshiping, you've not entered into that place where you're beholding his beauty and beholding his glory. If worship is not flowing out of your heart, forget just Christmas, but let's just call it that for this week. If worship cannot flow out of your heart at this Christmas season in which you are celebrating the gift of God's creation, the gift of God's creator coming to be your redeemer, if you can't worship now, you don't see him right. scales need to fall from our eyes because the message of Christmas is do not be afraid fear not fear not fear not fear not fear not fear not stand with me please in the name of the Lord